Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your patience. We are getting ready to do something we have never done before. What was to be an epic gala celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Great Lakes Historical Society is now an epic stay-at-home live stream event. The National Museum of the Great Lakes has gone through obstacles in the past, Lisa. However, they've been no comparison to the global crisis we've found ourselves in today. For the first time in history, we were forced to close our muse museum doors for three months in response to the pandemic. Back open now, and we are here in the National Museum of the Great Lakes Theater to celebrate Great Lakes history. And while we're not surrounded by the hundreds of supporters and historians we originally planned on, we know many are watching at home right now. And we are so grateful for all of them. And I'm happy to be celebrating with you and our small team here behind the camera, including our producer, Matt. Are we dialed in, Matt? Okay, we are <laughs> now <laughs> dialed in. Looking and sounding great from reports that I am getting. Nobody's <laughs> looking at a blank screen. I think we are now officially <laughs> safe to go. Okay, well, here goes nothing, Lisa. We got this, Kate. Roll <laughs> intro. The Great Lakes are special because count me down, tell me, count me down. they embody a way count of life. down. And as you learn more about the Great Lakes, you can learn more about yourself. A fascinating history. A great attribute to our commerce. What makes the Great Lakes so great is its connection between two incredible countries. Any aspect of it, it you get emotional. Go. Good evening and welcome to the National Museum of the Great Lakes live streamed H2O Gala presented by the Interlake Steamship Company. My name is Lisa Guyton from 13 ABC Action News. Thank you for joining me tonight as we work to keep Great Lakes history afloat. If you are hearing my voice and seeing my face, you have successfully navigated your way to our live stream production. Now, here are a few ways you can interact with us this evening. A few minutes ago, you should have received a text from us with instructions for our text to give feature. Simply respond to that text by typing G-I-V-E plus the amount you'd like to donate and your contribution will go directly to support the National Museum of the Great Lakes. It is quick, easy, and simple. Give what is easy for you. For example, if you'd like to give $100, text give 100. You will get an immediate text back thanking you for your donation. And if you happen to be watching this with a friend and didn't register yourself for the event, we encourage you to do so. Registering is simple, it does not cost a penny, and it will allow you to interact with our show using your own cell phone and participate in things like our silent auction. To register, visit nmgl.home.qtego.net. Once again, nmgl.home.qtego.net. If you experience viewing difficulties during our one hour show, we will be sending a link of this entire production to all registered attendees. Now, before we go much further, we simply must introduce you to one of the people who truly made tonight possible. The National Museum of the Great Lakes and Great Lakes Historical Society's Chairman of the Board, President of the Interlake Steamship Company, and our H2O Gala title sponsor, Mark Barker. Welcome, Mark. Well, thanks, Lisa. It's great to be here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Move your mic up. <laughs> I apologize. Mic check. It happens to us all. Are we there? Yep, yep. Okay. There we go. Well, sorry. We are, as, <laughs> as we are navigating this virtual world, we, right. we are learning how to use microphone technology. <laughs> so thanks, Lisa, and hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. It's great to be first, uh, I, it's great to be here. And I'd like to first thank all the mm -hmm. talented staff of the National Museum of the Great Lakes for the effort they've put in tonight's program. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be great. And, and I also want to really say thank you to our passionate board members mm -hmm. for all their support in making the museum um, an increasingly integral part of this great community of Toledo. I'm grateful to be here as, as the museum's board chairman and as a re representative of the Interlake Steamship Company. As part of the second generation leadership team of this family run company, 
I recognize our rich history connected to the Great Lakes, which is what makes our commitment to the Great Lakes Historical Society and this museum so special. During this unique and challenging time, we are proud to invest in keeping the Great Lakes historical history afloat through this H2O virtual gala. I hope you'll enjoy what our, de what our dedicated staff and volunteers have put together for you tonight, which will highlight the amazing work being done by, our, by the museum to preserve and share Great Lakes history. We are also excited to hear who will be the winner of the Great Lakes freighter trip through the Luck of the Lakes raffle. Thanks again for joining us. And now I'll turn the evening back over to Lisa. Just like night. everyone else, I am really excited to see who will win that once in a lifetime trip aboard one of Interlake's Great Lakes freighters. That Luck of the Lakes winner will be drawn later on in the show. Thank you, Mark, for being here with us and for Interlake's undeniable support of Great Lakes history. Now, in addition to Interlake's title sponsorship, so many other individuals and organizations have made tonight possible, including our Lake Michigan sponsors, ProMedica, the Betcher Foundation, World Shipping, and Fincantary Bay Shipbuilding. And I'm joined now by Kate Fineski, one of the key team members of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. And Kate, we are so excited about tonight's production, especially the introduction of the museum's new oral history initiative. The Great Lakes Memory Project. Tell us a little bit about it. It is yeah. so important. Well, you know, sometimes those memories just get trapped inside people and they don't get out and people aren't able to talk about them. Today's present is tomorrow's history and that's what the Great Lake Memories Project is all about. Over the course of the evening, we will be highlighting six Great Lakes stories from different individuals to showcase and document their extraordinary Great Lake memories. Well, the Great Lakes have certainly shaped the lives of countless individuals, including Paul and Leanne Gensman, who recently sat down with us to share some stories about their time as educators on South Bass Island in Putin Bay. Let's meet them now in this segment brought to you by ProMedica. I ever really thought I was going to live on an island. You have to be resourceful because it's a different community feel. It's, it's different when you don't have your Home Depot down the road or that sort of thing. You just get used to stocking up and relying on your neighbors for help and everybody is, is amazing at that. There's year round about 400 residents on Putin Bay and you get to know them and especially when you teach. My emphasis has been on stewardship when I taught on the island, it was both the emphasis of, of stewardship of freshwater, but also stewardship of the island itself, the geology of the island. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work being done by amazing islanders that are living there and cottagers too that come up. And there's so many um, protected areas there now that tourists can go and see and bike ride or go for a walk through a lot of these trails that lead to the caves. There are some really amazing areas. The Great Lakes are absolutely great because of the amount of fresh water available. I had a good friend I think who all lived of in us. Brazil and he was able to come here uh, and he, I took him to Mommy Bay and I remember him because water is a big deal where he's from and I remember him walking waist deep into Lake Erie and I remember him picking water up and tasting it and I remember him turning around and he was crying because he was overwhelmed with emotion because this is a resource that people are stressed out over all the time and we have as far as you can see that resource. I think all of us who have the privilege of calling this wonderful place home have Great Lakes memories and we want you to share some of yours with us. Using this program's chat feature, right below the screen on the right there's a button that says chat. Click on that and share a few sentences on what makes the Great Lakes so memorable to you. We'll have more Great Lakes stories to share tonight, but first let's introduce another feature of tonight's program. In March, at the onset of the pandemic, and just as Ohio's stay-at-home orders went into effect, the National Museum of the Great Lakes shared their first ever online exhibit titled The Port of Toledo, Then and Now. It's focused on images and stories of the Port of Toledo from then. This exhibit was merely the beginning of an extended three-part experience. 
Today, we are introducing you to phase two of that experience, a temporary physical exhibit housed within Prometica's historic steam plant gallery space. To introduce it, here is Prometica's president and CEO, Randy Ostra. Welcome to the History Walk Gallery at the Prometica Steam Plant in downtown Toledo. Prometica is happy to host a brand new exhibit from the National Museum of the Great Lakes, the Port of Toledo, then and now. Throughout this program, our friends from the museum will provide you with a virtual tour of the exhibit, featuring local celebrity historians to offer rich insight into the Port of Toledo and its place in Great Lakes history. So one of the things that was really interesting when we moved downtown was we hired um, an architect group to come and, and look at downtown development. It was part of uh, some work called the 22nd Century Committee. And one of the arch architects commented that as you looked at the downtown development and you looked at all the buildings, really the community had turned its back on the river. In a lot of ways, that's what we're here talking about today. It's about engaging the most critical part of our history, the Great Lakes, the Maumee River, and also the role that it plays in individual health and well-being. As we look around the environment today, you know, we take things for granted. We take the environment for granted. We take water for granted. And our experience with, with both the algae blooms and other things that we've seen with wildfires and other things, we realize how critical the environment, and especially the Great Lakes, is in our individual health and well-being. And that's why we're so excited to have this program being highlighted uh, over the next year and really celebrate the rich history and the importance of the Great Lakes. Wherever you're experiencing this, enjoy the program. I'm gonna go ahead and get myself a sneak preview of the Port of Toledo then and now. Now, over the course of this evening, we'll be taking viewers on a tour of this new exhibit. Kate, tell us a little bit more about how people can interact with it both tonight and in the future. Certainly, Lisa. Originally intended to be Prometica's first exhibit made more accessible to the public, we were determined our vision not be one of the many that was wiped out by the pandemic. Tonight, we will introduce you to this exhibit, but we won't stop there. <laughs> Using media partners, social media, and other online and in-person activities, we will continue to find ways to connect people both virtually and personally with this exhibit over the next year. And we cannot wait to see the additional creative ways you are going to bring people through this new exhibit space. Tonight, however, we will be giving you a first look with the help of exhibit curators, Carrie Soden and Ellen Kennedy, along with some local celebrity historians. Our first exhibit highlight features curator and museum archaeological director Carrie Soden, along with guest Kay Anderson. Now, Kay is the granddaughter of Harold Anderson, founder of the Andersons in Maumee. And as a young girl, her father, John, would often take the family down to the river elevator to watch the lake freighters fill with corn, wheat, or soybeans before heading back east or even out to sea. Here are Kay and Carrie touring the cargo and shipbuilding areas of the Port of Toledo then and now exhibit. It will be followed by another Great Lakes Memory Project segment from the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority President and CEO, Thomas Winston. So there's a lot that we're talking about here in our exhibits, but I think one of the most important things when you talk about uh, the Great Lakes and especially the Maumee is the cargoes and the number of cargoes we have coming in and out of here. Um, I know that your family was intimately involved in that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? It would have been grain. Uh, my grandpa, Harold Anderson, started the Andersons, and he always knew that once the St. Lawrence Seaway was dredged and they could get big cargo ships here to the Port of Toledo, they could load grain from the Toledo port. So not only is the farmer able to drop his grain off in the Maumee facility, they can bring it down here, load it on the ship, take it out to sea, international trade. Send it around the mm -hmm. world. Yeah, you've got so much in this exhibit, cargo and 
and shipbuilding. I didn't even know. Tell me, tell me something about that. Oh yeah, there were ships that you know took your family's grain up and down the river, um, out into the lakes. Some of them were probably built right here in Toledo as well. The American Shipbuilding Company in the Toledo shipyard, since its inception in the late 1800s, built well over 200 vessels, including pieces parts for the thousand footers that are still sailing today. That being said, shipbuilding on the Maumee was active even in the early 1800s when they were just building small sail vessels, small wooden vessels. Um, so the number of vessels that came out of this area is probably 500, 600, maybe even a thousand that we built in this area. Wow. My first foray into the Great Lakes was Lake Michigan. Born and raised in Chicago, I had the opportunity in many summer days to frequent North Avenue Beach, where I would enjoy the swimming, the piers, and all of the summertime activities at North Avenue Beach, uh, right off of Lake Michigan. Uh, so that was certainly, from a, a personal standpoint, my first foray into uh, Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes and all it has to offer. Having experienced the Great Lakes from a personal standpoint at Lake Michigan, now full circle to a professional standpoint, uh, the Maumee River leading into Lake Erie. Uh, it has been quite the transition, but a great one nevertheless. We enjoyed what we do here at the Port Authority and the significance of the Port of Toledo. Directly and indirectly, over 7,000 jobs are attributed to the Port of Toledo, and the economic impact is uh, on the average of $670 million on an annualized basis. So with the Port of Toledo being the largest landmass uh, port on the Great Lakes, we average anywhere between 9 to 12 million tons of cargo that comes into uh, the Port of Toledo on an annualized basis. Uh, generally over 500 vessels domestic um, Canada and also overseas vessels also um, travel through and from the Port of Toledo as well. I think it's, it's very significant that um, we value uh, the Great Lakes um, as a great attribute to our commerce and I think uh, something that uh, holds dear to my heart and hope to continue to contribute to uh, the fine features and, and uh, attractions of the Great Lakes going forward. Matt, you were on all those interviews. Did he say 12 million tons of cargo comes into the Port of Toledo per year? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, between 9 and 12 million. Um, he also talked to us about the Cleveland Cliffs project underway that's going to bring in an, an additional 2 million new tons wow. for year, wow. per year. And it's pretty amazing. Um, I also want to say we got a... Great Lakes memory on our chat feature from Amanda. She said, one of my favorites was the shipwreck tour on Lake Superior oh, yeah. in Michigan, yeah. then kayaking to view the picture rocks, absolutely breathtaking and magnificent beauty of our Great Lakes. Thanks, wow. Amanda. Wow, that's cool. What It's so fun to hear those memories. Speaking of amazing, um, I am floored by the participation in the Luck of the Lakes raffle this year, which has raised over $120,000 for the <laughs> museum. We'll be drawing the winner of that raffle later on in the show. It is a spectacular trip, and someone is going to be very happy to win that tonight. Preserving the past and present through the Memory Project and the Port of Toledo exhibit, both of which you've seen highlighted tonight, would not be possible without your support. Countless people like you Help us keep Great Lakes history afloat, and the museum continues to need your financial contributions. You can support them by bidding in the silent auction or go through the text to give option.
Right, Kate? Yeah, simply reply to the text that we sent you on your cell by typing G-I-V-E plus the amount you wish to donate and your contribution will go directly to support the National Museum of the Great Lakes. And tell us a little bit about the online auction you folks are hosting in connection to this event as well because there are some more spectacular opportunities for people. Certainly, Lisa. On Thursday, September 17th, we opened our H2O auction featuring Great Lakes memorabilia and once-in-a-lifetime Great Lakes experiences. There are so many cool things open <laughs> for bidding. There's literally something for everyone, from the fishing enthusiast to the adventurer seeker to the history buffs out there. Actually, joining us at our next stop of the Port of Toledo exhibit tour is one of our H2O event committee members who also donated a fabulous auction item. Um, item 236 on the auction is a GPS guided audio tour along the Maumee River developed by Toledo historian Ted Long. Then because all of our items have this kind of unique twist they do. to them, the winning bidder and guests will also get a personal guided history tour of downtown from Ted himself, including amongst other things, a private showing of the Port of Toledo then and now exhibit. Now, this program would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, including Lake Michigan sponsor, World Shipping. Thank you to them. And to all of you watching tonight for helping to keep Great Lakes history alive and afloat. Let's head back to ProMedica and the Port of Toledo exhibit to learn more from the local history author and curator of HolyToledoHistory.com as he tours the recreation and fishing portion with Kerry. Following that will be our third Great Lakes Memory Project segment featuring Pat Appold. Enjoy. So one of the things that I found fascinating when I was starting to research this exhibit was the fact that the wide and varied uses of recreation on the river. Did you know there was a casino here in the early 20th century? I mean, come on. Yeah, casino. In fact, sometimes if the river's blowing the right way, you can still see where the uh, boardwalk's at. And then just north of that was Willow Beach, which was a big amusement park. Oh wow, amusement parks too. Amusement parks with roller coasters. In fact, the roller coaster there was actually originally built for Cedar Point and they flipped a coin and Willow Beach won out and the, the thriller at Willow Beach was originally scheduled to be put into Cedar Point. Oh. But, but it was the river and, the, and that whole idea of being on the water that makes that area so attractive for an amusement park. I, I agree and I think the water is what drives so much recreation, um, whether it's just going for a drive on a nice day or going for a boat ride or a kayak ride, it's, it's amazing how much that we can do now, let alone that they were doing 100 years ago. Well, the thing that surprised me in this work, and I really loved the exhibit, was the, the yacht clubs. You found that yacht clubs go back to when? Oh, yeah, the Toledo Yacht Club is actually one of the oldest yacht clubs uh, in the country, sometime in the mid to late uh, 1800s. It's, right. it's crazy. incredible, I had no idea. And then there's, I think, six yacht clubs now along the river. Yep. Six on the river and then six just outside the mouth of the river. That is awesome. Great. The Great Lakes have been a constant in our lives because we grew up with them, we know them well, particularly Lake Huron because that's where Saginaw, the river goes into the bay and uh, the lake. Um, Jim grew up as the son of a, it sounds like a song, Saginaw Fisherman, and <laughs> uh, I grew up going occasionally perch fishing. One of my loveliest recollections of my life was going out in a rowboat with my father and my brother, who was two years younger, and catching perch just offshore in Saginaw Bay. And my father did nothing but take fish off and put worms on and take fish off and put, and we just pulled them up one after another. And, and to me that, I, I thought, is this the way, what the heck, this is nothing to this, this is fishing. Jim and I eventually became great walleye fishermen um, in Lake Erie, particularly, but some in Lake Michigan and some in Lake Huron. The lakes have been a, a real stable part of our lives. They've always been there. We've relied on them for recreation and for water source. Uh, 
ref refreshing our, our souls, really. Jim was a, he had a quiet force about him, and I don't think Jim recognized the influence that he had, but there are a lot of people that if Jim Appold was supporting something, they were, they were for it too. If he thought it was right, um, full conviction, that was everything for him. his enthusiasm for whatever he was doing. He was going fishing, he was enthusiastic, he was prepared, he was excited about the adventure, everything, it was an adventure. And he loved sharing, so he would bring people from all over the United States. Um, I could name names, but I won't, of people who got fishing out on Lake Erie because of Jim Apple. And uh, I, I, I love that about him. That's the thing about the Great Lakes. Any aspect of it, it you get emotional. <laughs> you get passionate. Um, and that, I remember that about Jim. Thank you to Pat Appold for sharing those memories of Jim, her beloved husband of nearly 60 years. Jim died in April of this year. As Pat said about his quiet force, Jim was so influential in our community and beyond. A man who is missed by so many. Yes, and one of the things he was so passionate about was supporting our Great Lakes history, and we are forever grateful to both Jim and Pat Apple. Uh, Kate, you mentioned before the video how Ted Long donated uh, one of our Great Lakes auction experiences. Well, Pat did as well. Talk about Oliver House, item number 235, it's special. Yeah, this is a really cool experience. You'll get to enjoy a behind the scenes look at both the Oliver House and the brewery given by John Appold, along with a dinner for six at Rockwell's. The Oliver House stands as the only remaining hotel designed by Isaiah Rogers. After 150 years of wear to the building, this pre-Civil War hotel has been renovated to reflect its architectural as well as historical significance and is now the home of the Mommy Bay Brewing Company in Rockwell Steakhouse and Lounge, which superior service, great cuisine, wonderful meal. It's a truly impressive setting. It's really beautiful. It is. Uh, I want to jump in here really quick. We are, our auction is going really well. We have a lot of bidders. Um, our text to give, just to give an update on that, we're at $710. So keep those text to gives coming in. And I think, Lisa, you're going to bring back those details for us? Yes, let's bring back those text to give details. Kate. Yeah, well, with significant lost revenue from months of forced closure, the pandemic really brought with it struggles of historic proportions. The museum has since reopened to the public, but reopening that with a loss of over $80,000 still remains an uphill battle for us, making this year's H2O fundraiser even more important than years past. So consider texting a donation of any size to help us keep Great Lakes history afloat. Respond to that text you received when you registered. Type G-I-V-E plus the amount you wish to donate, like texting give 50 to donate $50 or give 10 to give $10, give five, and so on and so forth. And your contribution will go directly to supporting the incredible work of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Okay, moving along. We, we just finished up a memory project segment with Pat Apple. The next guest touring our Port of Toledo exhibit is Ted Ligabel. Uh, Pat actually introduced me to Ted when we were having lunch together at the Oliver House. Ted has been involved with the museum and I followed up with him afterwards and I, I got to tell you, I don't think that Ted knew exactly <laughs> what he was getting into uh, after our first conversation, but I'm happy to know him and to have him involved with us here tonight. As some of you may know, Ted spent several years as a grassroots preservationist working in nonprofit university and governmental sectors before joining the Eastern Michigan University faculty in 1991. He has written numerous works on history, architecture, and historical preservation, and in 2018 was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Let's join him and Ellen Kennedy at the Port of Toledo Then and Now exhibit, which will be followed by another Great Lakes Memory Project video.
Well, like many families in the uh, Great Lakes area, I've got a long, rich history of a family that included engineers, lake captains, uh, and people who kept lighthouses. Yeah, well, and the Port of Toledo has a long history of having navigational aids, including lighthouses and buoys and different ways. The Maumee River is an interesting um, approach to a port. It, it drops a lot of mud and it has a lot of course changes that needed um, a lot of help for sailors to get into the Port of Toledo. Um, and so over the years, there were many different ways that they that they did that, and a lot of different people who were part of that service, like Mr. Bowman here that you see in the photo. So I learned early on that those navigational aids were critical to how people got in and out uh, uh, of this part of the, the western basin of Lake Erie especially. Yes, and there's been a long history of engineering work on the Port of Sledon on the Maumee River, um, specifically to develop the straight channel to get people into the port more easily and leading to the building of the Toledo Harbor Lighthouse, which is a really iconic lighthouse on the Great Lakes especially. There's not another Romanesque architecture <laughs> lighthouse um, anywhere on the Great Lakes and it's a very iconic lighthouse and for generations there were families out there tending the lighthouse and Toledoans working to help other Toledoans come into the port. When you talk to shipwreck hunters, most of what you hear is the hours of painstaking work that goes into finding a shipwreck. I've personally been one of the first 10 people on a shipwreck, and the thought that there were, had been fewer people on that wreck than had been on the moon was awe-inspiring. The second you get off the dive boat and you take your first breath off of your regulator, you realize that you're doing something that's not natural for humans. You become some small piece of nature and you start descending, usually holding on to a line that's connecting the shipwreck to your dive boat. And there's a moment or many moments, depending on how deep you're going, where you have no point of reference. You can no longer see the surface. You cannot see the bottom and you are just traveling as the little being that you are. Until suddenly a shape appears and you realize that it's a shipwreck and you've reached your destination and you have the opportunity to explore something that people on the surface might not have even known was there if it hadn't just so happened to have been discovered and been buoyed and been made available to all of us as divers. I think that being on a shipwreck is the greatest reminder of how vulnerable we are as people. A lot of the shipwrecks on the bottom are literally final resting places for the brave men and women who used to be on them. And there are definitely a lot of emotional moments that you can have while you are thinking through some of that. It blows my mind that I spent so much of my life not knowing what was here, literally right next door. And I wasted a lot of years not appreciating or fully embracing what was here. And it similarly blows my mind that there's so much people still don't know that is right next door to them. Amazing to hear about and to see through the pictures Hannah provided. Now, I'm glad she was able to do that through scuba diving, but that's that's not for me. I think I'd like to tour it with a glass bottom boat, something like that. Yeah, me too. I would say the exact same thing. <laughs> Matt, are you a scuba diver? Uh, no, I, I, I have dived for rings at the bottom of the community <laughs> pool in the, I've done that, yeah. in the shallow section. <laughs> now, when we interviewed Hannah, um, she said that when she starts descending on a dive, 
it feels like an enveloping hug. Ooh, Ooh interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm still like the glass bottom boat idea. <laughs> you know, we have another story that came in on the chat section. Mm -hmm. This is from Bill. In 1963, I was camping with my family at the Straits of Mackinac. I have a fabulous photo taken by my father of me standing in Lake Michigan with the Mackinac Bridge oh, in cool. the background. Yeah. I've had a strong affinity for the Great Lakes since that day and chose to make my home in Cleveland so I can be an advocate for Lake Erie and enjoy paddling, swimming, mm -hmm. and scuba diving in the Great Lakes. Oh, Thank you, Bill. And how's this for a smooth segue to our yeah. next featured auction item? What a, what a nice memory to share. Have you always wanted to find a shipwreck? Now is your chance with auction item number 209, shipwrecks. This opportunity is for two people to spend a day aboard a vessel searching for shipwrecks with auction item donor Tom Qualzik on Lake Erie. Tom has been a shipwreck historian and discoverer for over 30 years. Together, you will depart from Lakeside, which is a beautiful spot along Lake Erie. And while sailing, you'll assist Tom in his never-ending search for Lake Erie shipwrecks. It is a chance to participate in what could be an exciting day. Who knows, you might even get lucky and discover the next sunken treasure. Uh, once again, someone forgot to cue Kate. You know, this isn't my day job. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> and okay, so we'll, don't forget to text to give your donation. That's important and that's important for me not to forget to say, huh? Um, simply open the text you received when you registered and type G-I-V-E plus the amount you wish to donate and your contribution will go directly, directly to support the National Museum of the Great Lakes. So if you want to give 50, type G-I-V-E 50. Hey, you're doing a great job. We're having a lot of fun and you can be my sidekick <laughs> any day. Uh, we are so grateful to all of our sponsors and our next Great Lakes Memory Project video is brought to you by Lake Michigan sponsor, the Betcher Foundation. But first, our next Port of Toledo tour segment is with Ellen Kennedy and Bob Lucas. Now, Bob, as many of you may know, is the former president of United Way of Greater Toledo and the former president and CEO of DeNova, Inc. He is the immediate past president of the Board of Trustees of the Ohio History Connection and currently serves on the board of the Maritime Academy right here in Toledo. So let's head back now to ProMedica for your next look at the Port of Toledo, then and now. I'd like to learn more about the local history of tugs on the Maumee River. And I see these wonderful pictures here. Can you tell me more about yeah. the tugboat industry? Yes, and so, um, Shipping has been very important to Toledo for centuries, and with shipping, especially bigger and larger vessels, tugs became more and more important. And so over the years, there were more and more tugboats in Toledo, um, helping move vessels into ports, uh, helping do a variety of things. And we have actually had, working on the Maumee River, three different tugboats, all with the name Ohio. Um, the first was built in 1910 and it worked on the Maumee River. It was a harbor tugboat, so a smaller vessel. Um, the second to be named Ohio was actually built in 1903. It was built first, but it spent many years as a fireboat in Milwaukee. Uh, and that vessel didn't become the Ohio until 1972. And that actually is our museum ship now, the Museum Tug Ohio at the National Museum of the Great Lakes. It retired uh, in 2014 and they built a brand new Tugboat Ohio that was christened in 2018 and became the new Ohio, which is actually working on the river today. My first interest in Great Lakes history was uh, on a trip, a yacht trip that we took to northern Canada uh, when we discovered a gentleman whose name was Ori Vale. He claimed that he had the um, evidence and parts 
of the Griffin, which was the first sailing ship on the Great Lakes. And he could prove that that was, in fact, the artifacts from the Griffin. He was a big talker. He sold us considerably on his finds. And I was intrigued with his history that he provided us on the Griffin. And so I elected to do that for my history thesis. This is a photograph, a picture of what an artist um, concluded were the features of the Griffin, the first sailing ship on the Great Lakes. When doing the research on the paper, I was blessed to be able to have access to all the documentation in the museum. I remember doing this all in the attic, the 10 degrees above zero, below zero down up there, and uh, so I hurried up. <laughs> but it was a good experience. It was loaded with uh, beaver pelts from, George, from uh, Green Bay and was to sail across the um, Mackinac and uh, down into ultimately, desti ultimate destination was Montreal, where all the felt pelts were going to be shipped to Europe. Of course, the pelts were used at that time for fashionable men's hats, and they made kind of a felt out of the fur and the pelts never got to their destination. It was a small ship. It's been, if it's been anywhere, it's been on the water for a very long time. You know, it could have been just kind of drifted across the bottom of the lake, um, scattered around. Um, it's a worthy research project. Larry Betcher was truly instrumental in expanding and moving of the museum from Vermilion to its current home in Toledo on the Maumee River, Lisa. And we are in that current home right now, mm -hmm. an amazing space that has provided so many wonderful th opportunities to this community. And it is, it is a treasure and we need help to keep the doors open. And I think Matt's going to tell us about some of the help that we're getting. Yeah, and we are in that home stretch. Um, mm -hmm. Again, people are having a lot of fun with the auction. Uh, those text to give numbers are still coming in. We have cleared a thousand. Please Ooh. keep those hey, keep I'm those text to give donations coming in. We appreciate it so much. Um, I have a couple more memories that appeared in our chat. Ooh. The first one is from Mary Lou. Our family had a boathouse at Clifton Beach, near the Cleveland Yacht Club, yeah. where we enjoyed speedboat rides, often to Cedar Point or downtown Cleveland, oh, and other pleasure boating on Lake Erie. Lots of wonderful memories. Thank you, Mary Lou. And another one from Renee. I grew up in a small town outside Buffalo, New York, called Eden. During my summers home from college, I would often play competitive beach volleyball on the shores of Lake Erie. So many great memories of those years. Thank you, Renee. Interesting how they're all such different memories as well. Yeah. Uh, we really live uh, along an, in an incredible body of water that, that has provided so many wonderful memories and, and livelihoods and everything for this community. Absolutely. So, to support the continued operation of the museum, make sure you text to give your donation by replying to your registration, text G-I-V-E, and the number you'd like to donate, remember, and keep bidding on those auction items, including auction item number 206, donated by Larry and Karen Betcher. Now imagine walking out onto a private plane for a day of fun and adventure. Skip the lines in the airport and the hassle of security and x-ray machines. The possibilities for this experience are endless. You will leave from Port Clinton with up to eight passengers and coast your way across the United States up to 400 miles away. Spend the day touring in Washington, D.C. or hop on over to Chicago for a day of shopping or even spend a day on the Upper Peninsula exploring all it has to offer. There are so many options with this auction item. Get a group together to bid on this item and enjoy an incredible day of fun. Our final stop on the Port of Toledo virtual tour is with Carrie Soden and Tom Walton. Tom is a retired editor and vice president of the Toledo Blade. Since his retirement, he has written a humor column for the Sunday Blade and produces a weekly commentary on WGTE Public Radio 
called Life As We Know It. He has a close connection to the Great Lakes, having served as a crew member for a shipping season aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald back in 1963. After the Port of Toledo tour, we'll show you our final Great Lakes Memory Project video featuring Paul Lamar and the restoration of the Schoonmaker. This segment is brought to you by Lake Michigan sponsor, fin Fincantary Bay Shipbuilding, who is building the new interlake boat, the Mark W. Barker. Now, the Mark W. Barker is not scheduled to start sailing until 2022, but with auction item 221, you could be one of the first to have the beautiful limited edition rendering hanging in your home or office. The new 639 foot unloader will be the first new US built Great Lakes freighter in over 35 years. Now coming up after our final tour in Great Lakes Memory Project segment, we're gonna announce the winner of the Luck of the Lakes raffle Let's go now to the Prometica steam plant and the Port of Toledo then and now exhibit. So Tom, I know the Port of Toledo has been home for winter layups as well as long-term layups for a long time. And I know you and your family had a big part in that. Can you tell me a little more about it? Yes, my father was a lifelong Laker on the Great Lakes working on the vessels for the Ogilvy Norton Company out of Cleveland. And when the shipping season was over, he was done being chief engineer. His job was to winterize the ship and get it ready for the long winter layup. And uh, we would sometimes go down and visit him uh, during layup. And uh, he would often stay on the rest of the winter as a ship keeper. Ooh. And, uh, so, and that was quite a spooky experience for young kids like myself. Uh, you know, the, he was the only person on board. And uh, every creek, every and every crack and noise, whatever it was, was greatly amplified. It was a lonely job, but, you know, uh, the bay was good, the galley was full of food, the TV worked, so. I know the schoonmaker spent many winters in Toledo during winter layup. How did that come about? I think a lot of ships would winter wherever their last cargo was delivered. Um, and with the economic downturn in 1980, the uh, uh, Cleveland Coast Company laid up the, the Willisby Boyer and actually never used her again. She sat there for seven years before the city of Toledo worked out a deal to create a museum ship. I don't think the Boyer would be here, the Boyer, now Schoonmaker, would be here in Toledo without her having been long-term laid up in Toledo. She would have gone to, she would have probably gone to scrap or become a museum ship somewhere else, but we are so excited to have her now in the port of Toledo with such an amazing history here. Growing up, the history of the Shenango Furnace Company and that of the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker was something to be revered in my household. The ship sailed as the Schoonmaker from 1911 to 1969, and the ships of the Shenango Furnace Company were revered as being the most elegant on the inland seas. My dad had always had an affinity for the Shenango boats, and we had the fireplace from the steamer Shenango, which was the queen of the lakes before this vessel in 1909. Her fireplace was in our house that my dad had taken off the ship with a model of the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker on the mantle. That fireplace and that model sit in my house today, but it's something that when you looked at that green hull and saw the model, you knew that it was something special. The first time I would have seen the Schoonmaker in person would have been as the Willis B. Boyer in roughly 1985. And to this day, next to my desk, I have a picture with me and a little stuffed seal uh, with the Willis B. Boyer behind me uh, at five years old. And my dad always said that coming to the Boyer was like going to church to pay your respects to the history of Great Lakes shipping and that of your family. Uh, it has always had a level of mystique that ultimately taking over as her director when she was probably in her most vulnerable moments uh, was truly an, an honor, but also uh, the biggest challenge that I've ever faced. The ship was being considered for scrap. 
to even think about the ship that was awe-inspiring to me as a child on the fireplace mantel. Going to the shipbreaker's torch under my watch, it was inconceivable because in my opinion, the ship represents so much more, not only to Great Lakes history, but also Toledo history. We had a lot of work to do to build the slip that you see around us today, to be able to bring back that library, to bring back the name of a Congressional Medal of Honor winner who fought for the North during the Civil War, to bring the families of the Colonel and William P. Snyder who built the ship together for the first time and have a bottle of champagne broken by Mr. Schoonmaker and his wife Tracy on the bow of this vessel at the exact moment she had been christened 100 years before by his mother. That's never been done in maritime history and will never be repeated. I always say that whether it's preserving the Schoonmaker, trying to sustain the Port of Monroe, or advocating for the future of our industry, it's a kid trying to make his dad proud, ultimately. And I know that he's very proud. And Toledo, as a port, exists above all else because of her strategic location on a waterway. This river is the vein of prosperity in our community and the schoonmaker is the living symbol and the National Museum of the Great Lakes is the institution that takes that home. Now is the time many of you have been waiting for. We are going to announce the winner of the Luck of the Lakes raffle. One incredibly lucky individual will receive a freighter trip aboard an interlake steamship vessel. I had the chance to sail on the Tregurtha a few years ago, and it was an amazing experience that I will carry with me always. So imagine yourself on the deck of a 1,000-foot freighter steaming across Lake Superior. Pretend for a moment you're watching this same giant vessel work through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. There's nothing like it. It is an experience that cannot be purchased, and an opportunity to explore the Great Lakes in a unique and luxurious way and the food is amazing as well. Now to help with this drawing I brought Chris Gilchrist, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Historical Society and the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Chris tell us a little bit about what this fundraiser and specifically this raffle mean to you and the role the museum plays really in Great Lakes history. Sure. Well, Lisa, we've been doing this raffle for over 20 years. It is the most incredible way <laughs> that you can experience uh, the Great Lakes and, and the majesty of the Great Lakes. And uh, it, it, you can't purchase it. Plus, through the generosity of Interlake Steamship Company, not only we are providing an individual with a chance to, to experience this incredible opportunity, we're also uh, raising much needed yeah. funds for the National Museum of the Great Lakes here in Toledo. The, uh, um, oops, uh, as we all are well aware, 2020 hit us with unimaginable obstacles. Yet there is nothing I, our staff, volunteers, uh, and, and even visitors will do yeah. to, to push through these, these unprecedented times. This event, uh, this raffle, tonight's event, raise much needed funds for the National Museum of the Great Lakes and we need them today now more than ever. Well for those of you who purchased a ticket now is the time to see if you are the lucky winner and if you didn't purchase a ticket consider donating using that text to give option or bidding on an auction item. Now, the auction closes tomorrow Sunday at six o'clock at night. Every little bit will help keep Great Lakes history alive and afloat. So let's get started by drawing the third prize winner. And I'm going to put my mask on because Kate's going to join us again. Now the third prize is six tickets for next year's Luck of the Lakes raffle. That is a $600 value. So if you don't win tonight, you're going to have another chance to win next year. Oh my gosh, look at all those tickets. Okay. Roll the barrel. Our third prize winner. 
Okay, our third prize winner, a Mr. and Mrs. Les and Sue Barber of Bowling Green, Ohio. Congratulations. Mr. and Mrs. Les and Sue Barber of Bowling Green, Ohio. And that's that's an incredible prize because you have you know you got you got six chances already in the hopper for next year. <laughs> next up is our second prize winner, who will receive a day trip on the J.W. Westcott, delivering mail to freighters on the Great Lakes. And while we were taking that trip on the Tregurtha down through the Detroit River, the Westcott came up beside us. That was an amazing experience as well. Who knew that they delivered mail on the Great Lakes? The only floating post office in the United States. Well someone is going to have a chance to be part of that floating post office. Thank you, Kate. There we go. Dig down deep. Down deep. <laughs> there we go. Okay, the trip on the J.W. Westcott, Mr. William Mercer of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mr. Oh. William Mercer from Ann Arbor, Michigan. What? A, that, that's another you know, priceless experience you Exper can't buy. Yeah, so. you can't buy, and it's it's uh, truly, it, it, it tells a story of Great Lakes history. Well, the moment we've been waiting for. Here we for, are. The grand prize winner of the Luck of the Lakes raffle, one lucky individual and up to five additional guests will win a four to six day trip in the 2021 season on an Interlake Steamship Company, Great Lakes Freighter. Here we go, Kate. Okay. All right, spin it one more time. Here we go. Oh boy. Oh, let's see. No pressure. Oh my gosh. All the way down. Okay, really far. <laughs> this, wait, nope, I'm gonna go one more here. All right. There we go. Mr. Todd Uhas and Mr. Mrs. Cynthia Stahl Uhas, Shelby Township, Michigan. Mr. Todd Uhas oh gosh, and Mrs. Incredible. Cynthia Stahl Uhas, Shelby Township, <laughs> Michigan. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, there we have it, everyone, an H2O gala like we have never dreamed we'd have. We hope you enjoyed your evening with us. Please be sure to continue to send your text to give donations and bid on auction items. That auction, once again, closes at 6 o'clock tomorrow night, Sunday, September 27th. Remember, all proceeds are helping to keep Great Lakes history afloat and support the National Museum of the Great Lakes. And we want to be sure to especially thank all our sponsors, which we will list here. Thank you so much again for being with us. Good night. <laughs>